Good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Scholl. I am the lead learner at the SCEA's Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. I hope you're all doing well tonight. Thank you for joining us for this live stream. I'm really excited about uh, tonight's guest. Before we introduce our guest, I just want to share a couple of things that we have going on at the SCEA, some things we're looking at. One is, you know, it's really important that um, we protect um, the freedom of speech, freedom to, to read, um, uh, and freedom to teach the truth in our public schools. Most of us in South Carolina believe children should have that freedom to pursue their dreams. So we have to equip every school with the resources to deliver quality education that prepares every child for the future, no matter their race, background, or zip code. But certain politicians who have denied our, our classrooms the resources our children need are now spreading fear about our public schools trying to dictate what educators say and block kids from learning our shared stories of confronting injustice. When we speak up for an honest and accurate curriculum, we ensure that our South Carolina's public schools help all children move forward to a better future, regardless of where they live or the color of their skin. We ask that you take um, action now. I'm going to post the, um, the link in uh, to Facebook in just a minute, so you can can all do that. Um, I also uh, believe that we need to speak up about the uh, voucher schemes that we're seeing uh, promoted. Uh, we know that S thirty nine is the the name of the bill, um, and unfortunately, uh, this is a battle that we seem to have to continue to fight year after year where they are trying to divert funds from public schools to private schools. And there is almost a cynical, like there really is a disingenuous um, argument that they're making that this is, that their intention is to help students in poverty. Um, we know that the long-term goal really is to dismantle public schools um, so that they don't have to pay for them anymore. Um, this is a, a, a notion promoted by people that think that the free market is the answer to, to everything, and they do not have a, a value for public schools. Um, I personally come from a family. My parents, um, my mom was the first one to go to uh, college in her family. My grandfather was the first one on my dad's side. And without public, public, a public, a free public education that was quality and, and accessible to them, um, I wouldn't be doing this live stream with you tonight. There's no doubt about that. Uh, my three children have gone through public school. I went through public school. And so those of us who have benefited from public education have a duty to protect public education for future generations. And unfortunately, these voucher schemes are a step in the direction of ultimately dismantling them. And the process will be they'll try to convince enough people that they're doing this to give people, quote unquote, choice. The problem is it's not really choice if you don't have, if they're giving you, for example, a five or $6,000 voucher, but the tuition's $12,000, $14,000, you still can't really afford that. If you're, if you're in poverty, you really can't afford even, the, even with the voucher. Plus, they're not obligated to provide transportation. They just say, well, the voucher's got to cover your transportation. Well, if you live 30 miles away and you don't have a vehicle or you have to pay for the gas every day to get to drop your child off and to pick them up then how, how is a person in poverty going to be able to, to afford that? Um, also, they have the freedom to discriminate. So a private school that would get this, um, these vouchers could potentially uh, deny someone admittance based upon uh, a disability the child has because they don't have to necessarily be obligated to provide special education services. Um, they could deny someone based on being uh, LGBTQ, uh, identified as LGBTQ. Um, there's just... There are a whole host of reasons why this is such a bad idea. And the other piece is that they aren't held accountable the way public schools are. And that, to me, is the, the argument that I care about the least because I, I think we should do away and restructure the accountability system as it, as it exists for public schools. But what we can't deny is the fact that we would be diverting funds from private schools to public schools. And I think that's a, that's a terrible, I'm from public schools to private schools. I think that's a, that's a terrible idea. So if you agree with me, please use your voice um, uh, to, to against those voucher schemes. You can go to the SCEA.org slash S39. That's the SCEA.org slash S39. And as always, we invite you to be a part of our movement or to connect with us. You can connect with us at the SCEA.org slash connect. And if you're interested in joining our movement, you can see at the bottom of the screen, you can go to join the SCEA.org or text the word join to 48744. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Keneal, who's tuning in, who's our Uniserve director for the Midlands. Keneal, hope you're doing well tonight. Thank you for tuning in and, and sharing your comments. We appreciate that. Um, she's made a lot of great comments here. Just want to make sure we we post them all and you get a chance to read them. Um, and you can go to the SEA.org slash act if you'd like to act on those, those important issues. Um, yes. Thank you, Keneal, for tuning in. And thanks to everybody else for, for checking out tonight's live stream. So one of the cool things about the internet and social media is when you um, do certain things and people connect with you and see, hey, there's maybe there's a chance here for us to collaborate and to support each other's work. And it was really cool um, when um, this tonight's guest reached out to me and she sent me a copy of her book. And this is the book. It's called The Whole Teacher. It's a weekly wellness guide. And it's really, it's really great. It's organized into a bunch of different sections. And I'm not going to read through all those sections, but um, there's stuff like the first one is on stress, which you know, you know, we we talk a lot about mindfulness and, and stress reduction. Um, nutrition's another one, rest, and there's several other sections in the book. And I, what I, I, when I looked through the book, I thought this is a really, really helpful and very practical guide, especially as we start the new year and we're trying to establish new, healthier habits um, and trying to prioritize our own health and wellness. So she reached out, and um, what she says is she believes it's time to empower teachers to prioritize their health and wellness. She's a proud former teacher of eight years and the founder of Livable Learning, a wellness company dedicated to teachers. She's passionate about offering meaningful opportunities to establish whole teachers, teachers who confidently utilize strategies to pri prioritize their health and uh, happiness inside and outside the classroom. So she wrote this book, The Whole Teacher Weekly Wellness Guide, and she leads the whole teacher cohorts and workshops across the country. So let's bring her in lauren how are you doing tonight good todd how are you doing i'm doing well did i miss anything um that you'd like no, to you share? nailed that that was awesome <laughs> okay great so um let's first of all start with um talk about your transition like um you were you were in the classroom maybe you could talk a little mm -hmm. bit about your experience about in education and then how you made this transition to um, being an author and a supporter of um, teacher health and well-being. Yeah. So gosh, when I think back, I actually just left the classroom in June. So being a full-time business owner is still new to me. Um, I was one of those people who knew I wanted to be a teacher my entire life. Like, you know, those books that you make in elementary school and you write biographies, it's the nice hardcover books. I have those and I always wrote, I'm going to be a teacher. It was just something, you know, I felt I knew I was meant to do. And I'm so happy I did because I feel like teaching is what made me who I am today. Yeah. Um, I taught high school and then middle school for the majority of my eight years of teaching. Um, I'm actually here in Northern Virginia, right outside of DC. So my experience in my school here the last four years was unique compared to my teaching experience in Ohio, which is where I was before. Um, I was at a Title I school here, Title I middle school, and I had mostly ESOL students. So not only was my day-to-day -day experience as a teacher those last four years harder, I started to very quickly recognize that blur of boundaries and how my professional life was seeping into my personal life. And I think, oh, I just saw O-H-I-O. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> um, and so I started to figure out how I could make things better for myself. I wasn't as happy as I was in previous years of teaching, I was feeling more stressed and I wanted to be the teacher my students deserved, just as every teacher does. And so I had earned, I got a master's in curriculum and instruction. I was like, that's my next path. I'm going to work in the county level. And I was very interested in that. But once I started to recognize that that lingering stress was keeping me from living mm -hmm each day the way I wanted to, I pursued something different. So I actually um, became a student at the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. They're based out of New York. And so it was this year long, 
program as I was teaching to become a certified holistic health coach. And that was something I never thought I was, you know, going to graduate from a program to become a health coach. And it changed my life because I started to understand holistic health. So viewing someone as the whole person, which is obviously where the whole teacher came from. Um, And as I was going through that program, it clicked in me that teachers needed to hear this information. Mm. And the reason that clicked with me is because teachers have the most unique job. I mean, maybe we're biased having had experienced it, but the emotional and physical stressors of teaching are truly unlike any other career, you know, and I think unless you know someone who's a teacher or you're a teacher yourself, you don't quite see the extent of that. Right. And it just suddenly dawned on me that I was like, okay, how are teachers not provided professional, meaningful opportunities to learn this type of information? You know, we get those whole professional development days. And of course, we're going to, you know, learn new strategies to help our students, which is important. But I never attended a professional development that was about me. Mm. That was about taking care of myself first and about how to actually do that. And that is that realization, that light bulb moment for me is what sparked me to start writing the book. And then to, you know, I started doing some like mini workshops at my school and in the county. Um, And then I just, it, got more and more. And I was like, you know what, I'm going to take the jump and I'm going to do this full time because I just feel like this is such a needed space. Right. That's how I got here. (laughs) Yeah, that's great. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, we have that very similar type of mission, which is, Mm -hmm. you know, that that's what I was seeing. I started doing work at a a state agency that would work to recruit and retain teachers. And what I was seeing was a lot of teachers suffering. And the response to that is like, yeah, here's a new thing you can do with your kids. Yeah. You know, this that's the primarily, like you said, pro- pro- professional development has been, here are some ways you can maximize student achievement through this new technique or this new whatever app or whatever. And like you said, all of that's, it's important. It's an important part of what we do. But what we were failing to do was to pay attention to what was going on inside teachers. And we've seen, you know, the, the, the stress levels, they were already high, but then the stress mm-hmm. levels continue to um, increase and then you go through the pandemic where they increased Mm -hmm. more and now you've got layered on top of that when I you know all this stuff that educators are having to face about being you know uh, accused of indoctrinating kids and all this other like Mm -hmm. political stuff that's really just a distraction and I think it's just a lot that educators are having to deal with and as a result we're seeing so many of them with mental and physical health crises and then leaving the profession just to save themselves. And I, and that's such a shame because that ends up hurting students more than anything yeah. when good people leave the profession. So I love what you do. And I love, um, I think that needs to be a priority for all school leaders and, and people like you uh, in place to support our educators holistically, because it is, mm-hmm. it really is about prioritizing everything. Like I, I really talk to a lot of young teachers, especially it's so easy in the profession to put yourself on the back burner, to put your health, your diet, your your nutrition, exercise, all that stuff gets sacrificed so that you can get more done for your students. And then you wind up 10, 15 years down the road with enormous health and mental health um, issues. So let's talk a little bit about your book Mm because I that's important. Thank you so much for sending me that copy. Oh, of course. I, I appreciate it. Why don't you talk a little bit about the book and what inspired the book and mm-hmm. if people um, are interested in it, what they can, what they're going to find when they. Yeah. Look. So <laughs> when I think back on this whole process of writing this, I, it's still surprising to me because I'm all of a sudden now holding this. And this was, this took me about a year and a half, you know, as I was going through the program, I had started writing it and then the actual design of it, it was such a neat experience. And so, you know, it's so cool to be able to talk about this. And I'm 
so excited to share it with people because my goal was to one, most importantly, show teachers that there are simple, simple strategies out there in all categories of our health that they can implement not only at home, but also at school. And so when I was planning this out, I kept thinking to myself, every strategy I put in here has to be something that's not only realistic, but that's also quick because we know that the teacher's schedule is pretty much second to second and they're not gonna be able to spend 25 minutes during their one planning period to do something and that's okay. I wanted them to recognize that that's going to be the scenario for you know, the duration of their career, but there are ways around that. So just to kind of show everyone, I will start by, Actually, Todd, before I get into the tabs, can I share my screen? It's just so I can yeah, show sure. the categories of the whole Absolutely. teacher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that would be helpful. Yeah. Me, I think so too. Put this over. Yeah. So is that, do you see that? Yes. Okay. So this is how I laid out the entire guidebook. So I came up with 12 whole teacher categories and these were based on things I was learning in my health coaching program, but I adapted categories specifically to teachers. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice that it's intentional that only one of the categories is passionate teaching. Mm -hmm. So the others involve, I won't read um, each part of it, but just stress, nutrition, joy, movement, social life, creativity, rest, finances, mindset, environment, and relationships. And as I was learning about holistic health, I, st as I said before, started to realize that, wow, all of these relate to our lives inside the classroom too. And so the goal of this book is to equip teachers with actual strategies inside and outside the classroom. So basically, if you look at how this guidebook looks, it looks a little small, but there are those 12 tabs on the side. So the 12 categories are the 12 tabs. Then I was pretty intentional about the order. Teaching is last because I want teachers to work through this and recognize that they're prioritizing all these other categories. And then all of a sudden they get to teaching and they're like, huh, wow, teaching was not the problem. You know, it was all these other categories that I now oh. learn to prioritize. Um, so there are 25 weeks total. So it takes actually about six months to work through this guidebook. Um, and the way the tabs work, so just as an example, the first one's stress. So it has all the holistic health symbols. And then there are three weeks in the stress category. So just as an example, the first one is utilizing deep breathing. And so I always write an intro and the intro is very intentional about connecting that strategy to teaching. So why does that actually impact teachers? And then when they open up to the week, every week looks the same, kind of looks like a planner. So it's mon every Monday is a Monday motivation question. So, you know, a high mileage, open-ended question that really gets them to think about how they are implementing this into their life or how they're not. And then Tuesday through Friday, I give them actions. Some days have more than one, so they can choose, but it's an action to implement at a particular point during the school day to practice that strategy. And then there's weekend extensions. So just like we extend students learning, we want to extend what the teachers are learning into their weekend. Um, and so, you know, as I said, each strategy is fast. And I also want teachers to recognize that there's, I think it's total, there's like 220 strategies in here. Not every strategy will work for everyone. Right. That's impossible. It, it, the beauty of it, though, is that you're learning what works and what doesn't. And every teacher has such a different day to day schedule, a different um, type of student they're working with, like a SPED teacher has a very different day than a gen ed teacher or, you know, a teacher working with mostly ESOL students or working or teaching mostly honors classes. It's so different, but you very quickly start to realize what works for you and what doesn't. And so, you know, as teachers work through this, it just allows them to 
gain that wide variety of almost like, you know, skills they can put in their, their tool belt. Like they can pull out different skills and strategies then when they're feeling a certain way. So it's all just about learning about their needs and who they are and what that looks like for them. Right. So they can, what I like about this book is, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be gone through like in a sequential order. Yes. So, if, yes. if, so if I'm a, if I'm a teacher and, and I start this new year and my, my goals really, my thought process is like my stress level is okay, but my nutrition maybe needs some work. Mm -hmm. but then they can go to the nutrition section and then they can go through the, the weeks that you have there um, and include like each day of the week and then on the weekend. And, and there's just these, these sort of suggestions and then they can adopt the habits that, 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 that yes. work for them. And I love that. It's like, it gives people options to go through and sort of figure out, you know, on their own, where, where does my wellness and my sort of prioritizing myself, where maybe do I need to do some work on that? Yeah. And it, and it isn't overwhelming where you've got to like, I've got to do all 12 categories, mm -hmm. all like teachers get in that mindset, you know, because yeah, that's, absolutely. You, know, you were evaluated by all these things. Well, I've got to get them all, you know, it's <laughs> yep. like there's a rubric that someone's going to evaluate me on. And I've got to, you know, I've got to master yeah. all 12 sections. I think it's really important for educators to start with, you know, sort of one area and sort of, and sort of see, you yes. know, what it is yes. that, that they need for themselves and then prioritize yeah. starting there. Yeah. And I'm glad you noticed that because I was intentional about there are no dates or, you know, months that like a typical planner, it's very much personalized to how a teacher wants to go through it. Right. And, you know, something really cool I've learned from talking to teachers who have, you know, worked through it or are in the process of working through it is that they start to recognize like, <laughs> oh, you know, I actually thought that I had you know, nutrition under control, but actually now that I'm looking at this, there's some new things I want to try. And so it's very eye-opening and humbling, I think, for all of us to recognize that, oh, you know, I actually really enjoyed that whole week about blood sugar because I never recognized that my irritability during fifth period could be connected to what I ate for lunch. And right. I think it's, you know, you and I, I think, talked about this when we first met that there are so many things that feel out of control for educators mm -hmm. in the world of education, you know, like standardized testing and evaluations and all that. And any opportunity we have to give teachers control over what their day to day experience is, I think, is so important. And that's ultimately what this does. Yeah. And w the other thing that it does is it's very realistic in terms of. Mm -hmm they can get right to the point. Yeah. You know, it's not like a lengthy text that uh, it's yeah, not, yeah. not have time to read a 300 page book about nutrition. <laughs> it's yes. like, it, goes, it gets right to the point and gives them specific things that they can put in action right mm -hmm. now without yeah. it being overwhelming. And that, yeah. that I think that's, what's great about it. And they can skip around and, and find the, the, the pieces that, that work for them. Um, yeah. It's really, it's, it's such an important thing, and it's really hard to get this through to educators because we tend to the the, the profession tends to attract giving people and yeah. self sacrificing people, mm -hmm. um, and, and and what ends up happening is you just continue to sacrifice more and more of yourself, and then you're in many instances educators are gaslighted every time they say, "Well, mm -hmm. I, I need to prioritize myself. I'm not going to that thing after school. I'm not yes. going to." engage in that yes. just the weekend i'm gonna you know play games with my family and it's mm -hmm. like there's this sometimes i think what happens is there's this pressure where some of these teachers who get re a lot of pats on the back and say they're, they're a great teacher they're you know they're the ones who are burnt kind of like burning themselves yes. out and then and then the other educators feel like well i got to keep up with that because that's kind of like the standard mm -hmm. and then you feel like if, if i don't keep up with that person them and I, am I slack? Am I not going to, yeah. you know, be eligible for teacher of the year? Like whatever, whatever yeah. internal pressures there are. And it's like really educators just need to step back and the entire really system needs to step back and say, we're human beings first and let's take yes. care of each aspect of that humanity. And mm -hmm. then we actually will be able to keep these teachers in place. They'll be well 
and they can stay in the profession for a longer period of time, hopefully, uh, yes. throughout their whole career. You know, that got me thinking about the last couple of years when I truly started to practice what I was preaching, you know, practice what I was learning with wellness. I started to notice that I was making very intentional decisions at school. So for example, I was lucky. I had two planning periods actually at my school, which was awesome. And a lot of teachers I knew, and this is not everyone, but a lot of teachers I knew used some of that time to socialize. And I, you know, there's a whole section on, on social, you know, social, having an enjoyable social life, but I had to recognize that if I was going to get done what I needed to get done, I needed to often just sit and put some music on in my room and get stuff done. And I wasn't necessarily going to go to my neighbor's classroom to talk to everyone. And could I do that for five minutes? Yes. But then would I need to leave? Yes. And go back to my room. And then other decisions were, you know, like I was leaving by, I was allowed at contract hours to leave at three. So I was always out of there by three 30. And were there some days I needed to stay? Yeah, that would happen once in a while. But I started to recognize that when I held this boundary to myself, then I was more just strong with my time management. Like I said, during my planning periods, I made more intentional decisions of how That's I utilized right. my time. Mm -hmm. And but but like you said, there is still this unfortunate stigma that and I even heard. I've heard teachers say comments like judging others for, oh, that's the teacher that gets out at right. by three thirty. Yeah, they leave right when like, the bell is. Yeah. 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 When I first started teaching and and at first it and at first I was like, well, I guess I can't leave when the like even yeah. though I, I don't have any other work to do, I guess I can't leave now or they're gonna judge me. Yes. And it's, oh my gosh. It took me a few years of of kind of getting a little more confidence in myself. Yes. So if I don't have work to do, I'm leaving. Like I'm not yes. leaving. When my con when my contract and hours are over, yep. I'm gonna leave unless I, there's something I need really need to stay for. I'm not or want to stay for. I'm not yep. gonna stay, and I'm not gonna get here early. And I'm gonna you know I'm gonna work my hours. I'm gonna do my job. And if someone else wants to judge me for that because they stay after every day for two hours, well that's on them. If yes. they want to do that and sacrifice their personal time and their with their family and friends, whatever, that's fine. But I'm not doing that. Yeah, and you know. Uh Amen to that, because I just feel like it's a hard truth for a lot of people to take a step back. And I can confidently say that a lot of times, anytime I heard a teacher say a negative comment, kind of judging someone else for having those particular boundaries, mm -hmm. knowing that person, I think it stemmed from something a lot deeper. I think it stemmed from maybe they might not be prioritizing things that they know they should be when they go home. And so then it's easy to judge someone for being like, you know what? I actually, to be the teacher, I even want to dream of being, I need to leave. I'm going to go on a walk. I'm going to have a nice dinner. And then, you know what? I'm going to read and I'm not going to get home at 6 PM because then I can't do those things. And I also started to recognize the, the trickle effect because it just, I started talking about that more to people. And then even just my actions that I started to make it just seem less of a bad thing to the people I was closest to at school. And I would encourage them to leave. I'm like, well, why are you staying? Why are you still here? Why did you stay until then? And usually people can't even fully answer. They're like, oh, well, I had to catch up on grading. I'm like, well, did you have to, or could you have done that earlier and during your planning period, or could you do that tomorrow? You know, I want to so, normalize, like when people have planning, I'd like to normalize, like going on walks, meditating, oh, yes. doing nothing, uh, yes. reading, listening to music. Mm -hmm. I want to normalize not feeling like you've got to fill that planning time. Yeah with schoolwork all the time and that you've got you have to stay after for a certain amount of time and what we what we've got to do and this this requires collective action which is where the SCEA comes in which is why we've combined 
like so when you talk about self care, and I I love the quote. It says trying to build a life that you don't regularly regularly have to escape from is mm. the best definition of self care that I've ever heard. Um, yeah. So, but when we tell people that, you know, it's it's easy to say, well, take care of yourself, prioritize yourself. But then we've also got to collectively, as educators, our profession needs to come together and say, together, we're not going to stay after you know, an hour yeah. or two beyond our contracted hours mm -hmm. every day. We're not going yeah. to come in on the weekends unless something that we volunteer we want to do or unless you're going to compensate us. We're not going yeah. to, you know, like we're going to utilize our planning period the way we feel like we need to. We're going to own our own professional learning, like stop giving us this top down stuff and like yeah. force us to go to PLCs that aren't even necessarily relevant to what yes. we're doing. Let us choose like, like maybe what a person, what I mean, maybe what an educator really needs is that time to meditate or that time yeah, to want to walk mm -hmm. or to create a, a diet plan for the week, like their meal mm -hmm. plan for the week or whatever yes. it is. And they don't necessarily yeah. need to go and learn more Kagan stretch, whatever yeah. <laughs> nonsense that they're, yeah. that they're, that they're going to drop a year or two from now anyway. Yes. So it's like, that's, where collective action has to yeah. come in with why we are very we promote being a member of the SCEA, uh, mm -hmm. which which also makes you a member of the NEA and being a part of a collective movement to so that you're not alone do in, yeah. in for that. Yeah, and you're so right about it starting from the top. And that's why conversations like this are important. And I'm glad that they're finally happening. I feel like so much more can be done mm -hmm. but i think it is all just getting on the same page and i also believe we've talked about this before how a one-stop shop of a workshop mm -hmm. isn't effective enough and i do think right. there are so many workshops i attended that were inspiring and i walked away from <laughs> with a new book you know that i probably wasn't going to read the whole thing of but feeling inspired and feeling like oh these are some new strategies i can use with my students but i think with wellness it the only way we're all going to understand how impactful it is, is by having longer conversations about it. And so I applaud, you know, an administrator or a school that's going to have like a wellness workshop. That's great. But what I also sought out to do was ask myself, how can we create resources that are not just a one day thing, because yes. that's never going to solve the problem. And as you know, we just have to get anyone county level and administrators to recognize that because it, yes, it seems overwhelming for something to, for example, last like, you know, six months, but that's really the only way that we experience change. And we have to all trust that and be in it together. Mm -hmm. um, but I do also, I will say it is important though that teachers feel like they have a choice because I think wellness is such a taboo thing now in the world. You have to be careful how you talk about it. And so I think that, you know, if any administrators listening, for example, it, it's not always wise to force an entire staff to participate in, you know, a wellness workshop because a lot of people are just naturally very, you know, they're just adverse to that. It's, like wellness, I don't, I'm, I don't need to talk about all that, yeah. you know? And so not only do we have to be careful with the types of opportunities we provide and how we offer that to teachers in allowing them to choose, but just what the quality of that is as well. Yeah. Um, we, I'm, working with, I'm working with a school. We're setting up a wellness room in the school. They happen to have this, this awesome giant room that hasn't been used and it's just kind of been storage and that kind of thing. So we're setting up this wellness room and it's exactly what you're saying, which is we were the, the notion is the, we're going to set up opportunities for wellness activities that are completely voluntary yes, so that you come awesome. from before school, during planning or after school to utilize this room for a variety of different wellness activities. We're mm -hmm. going to do be mindfulness there will be some exercise equipment i think they're going to do some yoga classes up there and that kind of thing and people can come or not come and that's yeah. that is a really really critical 
piece that you're talking about there because if everybody's forced to go to the mindfulness session and and you've got half of them are like i don't i don't want to do this like this, yeah this then then it's then then the, the whole idea of wellness becomes just another thing that you're forcing on teachers rather than and yes. stripping them of autonomy in a different way yes yeah and you know one thing that just kind of going along with this guidebook is one really powerful thing I've been so happy to work with teachers on is when um, teachers at their school form a whole teacher cohort. And so it's just a small group of teachers who work through the guidebook together. And then they combine some workshops that we go through together. But it is that six month process that they go through as a group. But again, it's all choice. So you know, the biggest cohort I've worked with has been 22 teachers, you know, obviously not anywhere near the entire size of a staff. And those are the experiences that are truly impactful. Like I have worked with, I've done a whole school workshop and yeah, it's an awesome feeling. And it's so cool to see the teachers talking about all this, but again, it's just not quite that same connection where I've made a choice and I'm here because I want to learn. I see how this connects to me. And the more, again, the more opportunities we provide for teachers to have honest conversations by choice about all of these topics, the more impactful it will be. Absolutely. Yeah. You, I know you had some other slides that, and we saw oh, your sure. slide, slide deck up well, there. So you want to go yeah. through those. Let's make sure we get through those. Uh, a few things. things. Well, you know, we've kind of naturally talked about a lot of this, but, you know, something I, I love to always point out to teachers is that it is hard work to prioritize our health and happiness. And, you know, the examples we were saying earlier of being like, hey, I am going to leave at 3.30. That's not necessarily the easy decision to make. It's actually easier to say, oh, yeah, I'll just I'll stay. I'll just stay until five or six and, you know, be the one that's here, it's harder to say, no, I I'm, I'm going to go. And so, you know, the purpose of discovering these strategies is from doing it's to do the hard inner work, because that's the only way that that sense of passion and purpose will ever be reignited within ourselves, which will then impact the fulfillment teachers feel. And, you know, I just want to share a couple of these. I have some statistics that truly are staggering and shocking when you start to recognize that, you know, this is not just one source that is starting to uncover that teachers aren't feeling fulfilled and that there's a problem. This is anywhere you look now on these dependable sources, these dependable websites, they're all looking into this. And so, you know, for example, these are these three are from the National Education Association, but yeah, love that. Yeah, they, you know, they released that 55% of educators that they surveyed were thinking about leaving the profession. And I just wonder what other profession are more than half of them considering leaving? Right. Because if you're and you know, if you're considering leaving, you're not able to put in all that you are into your career. And as right. you know, as you said, teachers are so selfless. And if you're already wanting to leave, but then you're trying to be selfless. That's exhausting. 90% mm -hmm. of those teachers said that feeling burned out is a serious problem. 90% of them. I mean, there's no argument there, you know? Mm. Um, this is local to me, but I did just think that this information was so sh shocking. This is from the Washington Post. This is showing the local counties in the DMV area their increase in resignations over the last two years. Look at those percentages of some of those counties. Fairfax County is one of the largest counties in the country, and they had an increase of 45% of teachers leaving. It's, you know, these percentages, I really really doubt are being seen in other professions in percentages of resignations. It's just outrageous. 96% in Arlington public schools. Wow. If we keep going, um, uh, even Johns Hopkins, you know, this uh, 
established university is starting to research this. And they found, you know, they stated a lot of teachers are not being prepared to monitor and mediate their own mental health. And that's a whole other conversation of trying to get this into, you know, a, undergraduate programs and things like that. Yes. But, but it is true that when you're experiencing a career where you have to combat compassion fatigue and then also be mm -hmm. creative and just one second to the next, it's so many different emotions. How are we not talking about strategies yeah. to refuel? Yeah, no, that point about preparing future teachers, like in our mm -hmm. college and universities who are, are in teacher ed programs, um, you know, like, like it's, yes, you need to learn how to write a lesson plan. Yes, you <laughs> yeah. need to certain methodologies. But the, to me, the number one thing they should learn the number one thing that they should learn in, in in their undergraduate studies is is how to how to protect uh, their own health, how to set boundaries so yes. that they don't burn themselves out. Because the whole point is, if if fifty percent, I don't know, the last number I heard was forty four percent of teachers oh, yeah. in the first five years. Are oh leaving yeah, profession. yeah. So if you're in the first five years, if say nearly half of educators are leaving in their first five years, you go to college for four or five years. And then half of them are leaving. So what was yeah. the point? And the yeah. whole point is if if they're not taught to prioritize their well-being, they're going to get burned out. They're going to want to mm -hmm. leave. And then then they've wasted all of that time getting a degree that they're not even using. Yes. And, you know, I wonder, I bet a lot of people would say like, oh, that percentage is so high because it's just teaching's not what they thought it would be or the, the students are challenging. And, you know, it's everyone goes into teaching knowing that it's a hard job that knowing that you're experiencing different types of learners and different behaviors and you are needing to be creative and make lessons. Everyone knows that. And so I argue that it really has nothing to do with that. It's just this reality of starting to recognize that the feelings that are involved with teaching are very impactful and going to high school and then college don't prepare you for the emotional and physical stressors of teaching. So if you were never prepared to deal with that, then of course you're going to want to leave within five years. Right. And the system you know? is, and the system itself has become toxified by yeah. the accountability movement that was in, I think I giving everybody benefit of the doubt was intended to try to ensure that all kids had a quality public education, no matter where they were. Mm -hmm. Um, Let's just, just let's just give everybody the benefit of the doubt and say that the accountability movement was built on th that intention. But what's happened is 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 it's 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 become the tail that wags the dog in the sense that the 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 testing the standardized testing scores yeah. uh, the, drive everything that happens in the building and drive this really inhumane system. Uh, it, it creates inhumane. Uh, environments because yeah. you're you're so consumed with data and so consumed with raising test scores that you're willing to sacrifice the happiness and well-being of yeah. of educators and their students to to meet those arbitrary goals that are that yeah. are set and you're yeah. rushing everybody through the, also we've seen I've seen in my throughout my career I started in 95 We've seen what used to be in college has been pushed down to the high school level, high school to the middle school level, and and and, and all the way down to the point where kindergarten or kin, uh, kindergarten students are doing stuff that used to be done in second grade, and it's mm -hmm. it's not developmentally appropriate, and it's also uh, it's just so much pressure to yeah. move kids along, to hurry kids along, so that uh, the 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 administration's hurrying, the educator educators are hurrying, yeah. the students are hurrying. And this is creating a dynamic that is not in alignment with human neuroscience. It's just not yeah. how we learn learn in a way that is healthy. And then yeah. we sacrifice we sacrifice everything to hurry up and do that. And there's no sort of holistic view to me. Like look, looking at the system, it's like go go look in an average cafeteria what kind of food they're serving, and that's like representative of the whole system is not designed to make anybody healthy or happy. It's yeah. just, just it's been wrapped around this accountability thing of, yes. of maximizing test scores. And, and, and yes. until we recognize that until we fix the, the, the system, then, mm -hmm. then educators, I think educators and their students are going to continue to suffer. Yeah. Uh, 
I really couldn't agree more. And just to add to that, you know, from personal experience, as I said, I worked at a Title I school here and my students were mostly ESOL learners. And what always baffled me is the pressure of those standardized tests and how these students from wealthier schools down the highway were taking the exact same test. And I truly, I mean, talk about just getting to the core of something affecting your morals as a teacher. I mean, it's that can drag you down every single day. And, you know, as you said, yes, there's so much that has to change in regards to things in the education world. But I think truly the only way I was able as a teacher to be to feel better in that scenario anytime I had to give them tests, which were multiple times a year, those standardized tests, is that I I had to do things to relieve those emotions on in my own life. And yeah. again, it comes back to having that control. Like I felt so out of control in those types of scenarios. But wow. what I did have control over is how I dealt with that afterwards. And yes, it's not fair to my students who had to endure those assessments every year. It's still not fair that they're taking them. But I was at least able to support them in a healthier way right. with because of how I was living my life. But it's like it, it that balance is really difficult. And, and this um, is the message I'm trying to get across to educators who kind of like when you talk about self-care or mindfulness, sometimes mm -hmm. they'll like push back and say, well, yeah. you know, I'm not time for that. Maybe you've had time. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. And I think what's happening is they're kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's like nobody's saying we shouldn't advocate for for you yes. to have more time and better yes. working conditions and better pay. And better and all, pay. All yeah. That's what we're doing at the SCEA. But while you're doing that, are you just going to mm -hmm. say, well, I, well, I'm just going to continue to sacrifice my – I'm not going to focus at all on my self-care or my health, health well-being and, or, or I'm going to quit? Like I don't get, I don't get the calculation yeah. there. So. Yeah. I think it's important for us to stress don't when 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 we are advocating for these practices and for prior to prioritizing wellness, it's not we're not saying that the external working conditions aren't important. What yes. we're saying is what we're saying is your inside life it, and your health is has got to be prioritized while you're fighting to change those external working conditions. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I'll go through just a couple more statistics that I found really interesting. So if you can see, I know it's a little small, but this is comparing teachers to principals to working adults. This was from, um, again, the NEA. And I just a couple things I found interesting. If you look at the first category, it says frequent job related stress. And teachers, it was 73% of teachers said they experienced frequent job-related stress, and only 35% of working adults said they typically experience that. That's a huge difference. That's mm -hmm. not just 35% compared to 40%. Right. I mean, like that's almost doubled. Yeah. yeah, it's just, to me, that is, you can't ignore that. And the other one I thought was interesting was at the end where it says resilience. So 80% of working adults said they feel resilient and 46% um, of teachers said they feel resilient. And again, I do think that's part of the, you know, a lot of those factors working against them in their careers, but that shows that strategies are needed to deal yeah. with that. Yeah. And it's important for if, if we have school leaders out there listening or policymakers, What's important is for you not to not, – the thing you shouldn't be getting from this presentation is, hey, I need to do a wellness session for, with, my yes. with my teachers, yes. and then you're not going to change anything structurally yes. to accommodate that. So you can't yes. tell people, you know, I need you to focus on your health and your well-being and practice mindfulness or self-care or go on walks or whatever, and then you're loading them down with so much work that they can't, they don't have time for it. Yes. It's really important that they coordinate and say, and give people a reasonable environment where they can't, can. Uh, yes. And to, to add to that, people don't know how to prioritize their wellness. And I think that is, you know, you might have great intentions in saying, you know, get it yourself out on a walk today, do uh, meditation, let's all have a lunch, a healthy lunch together, whatever. But 
when you re then release teachers from like a workshop that they're all in together or something, they often leave and they're like, well, what the heck do I do now? I don't know how to, I don't know strategies to work on my health and my happiness because that's overwhelming. That needs to be taught. It's, you know, and so yes, it, there's things that need to change then structurally within a school to allow those opportunities to happen so teachers can learn those strategies. Right. Um, one of the last ones I want to share was this really fascinating study. And this study was not done to point out anything about teachers. It was just to find which profession had the highest burnout industry. And this was our burnout rate by industry. And this was done last year, 2022. And mm -hmm. what do you know, K through 12 educations at the top. So 44%. Yeah. And then, you know, it's not listing every industry you can possibly think of, but look at some of the other ones like law, healthcare. The fact that teachers are at the top, again, it's just another study highlighting that there is an issue. So again, the argument of just trying to deny that this is a real thing or that this is not present everywhere, it's just, you can't say that anymore. It's right. obvious. And, you know, to some, I think this sums it up really nicely. And this is from the National Institutes of Health. So even the NHI is researching why teachers are experiencing such intense emotions. And, you know, they word it as teachers' health has received much more attention over the past century since school teachers have emerged as a category of workers highly prone to a variety of psychological, mental, and physical problems as a consequence of the stress and attrition they are dealing with every day. And I just think this perfectly sums up everything we've talked about. It's just that recognition that there are unique experiences that teachers are dealing with day in and day out and then, of course, they're going to have this buildup of stress. And, of course, they're going to want to leave teaching. And so, again, it all just comes back to providing those opportunities that teachers deserve. Absolutely. Well, we are closing in on the end. And I want to make sure um, I, I posted the website, livablelearning.net. And that is where you can find out more about Lauren's work. And if you... Um, Go there. Um, you can order the book uh, um, if you are interested. The whole teacher weekly wellness guide that is uh, available on um, on the, uh, the website, along with her contact information. So if you want to work with Lauren and invite her to do some some things with your school, or just to, if you just want to reach out and have questions for her, contact information is there. What else do you do you need to share with folks who are interested in connecting with you, Lauren? Uh, honestly, you covered it all. I'd love to talk to anyone who wants to learn more about, you know, how to start something in their school that is lasting, you know, that's not just a one day thing. And I have four offerings for schools, one, including the guidebook, um, that I truly believe based on my experience as a teacher, but also as a health coach and just having worked with teachers in different States now using the whole teacher framework, there's just so many ways and opportunities that we can easily, easily implement transformative experiences for your teachers in your building. And it doesn't have to be something that everyone feels pressure to participate in. That's where the change really happens is small groups igniting change within schools and learning how to actually do that. Awesome. Do you want, do you want to share your email address or should they just go to the oh, website? Sure. Well, actually I have, I can pull that up on a slide. I have, um, Let's do that. All, do yeah. That. All the information right there. Perfect. So, um, yep. Email, uh, website, social media, stuff like that. But awesome. so, honestly, so Lauren, I'd, go ahead. Go ahead, Todd. I was saying Lauren at livablelearning.net is your email. So if anybody wants to, um, get in touch with her, they can do that. Um, again, livablelearning.net is the website where you can find all this stuff. Looks like you have the Facebook group, Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, that's great at Livable Learning. Awesome. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't covered that, or I didn't ask you that you wanted to share with folks tonight? Or we 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 good? No, I thought that was awesome. 
you can tell we both love talking about this. So that was that was really fun. Yeah, I I think more and more folks are waking up to this. Yeah. It's a, it really is to me. It's it's a crisis, and you know it's yeah, framed as a teacher shortage crisis, but really what it is is to me it's a crisis of of inhumane treatment of educators yeah. and 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 educators. Um, you know, just working within a system where they're having to sacrifice so much of their their own well being that they're 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 falling apart, uh, or they're they're staying in and falling apart, or the or they're deciding out I, I can't fall apart, I'm I'm going to leave, and that's that's a shame, and that's that's something that we can do something about. It's going to take systemic change, which requires external advocacy through an organization like the SEA, like the NEA, or your state affiliate if you're watching in another state affiliate of the NEA. Um, but it also requires us to to set an intention. And we talked, you used that word a couple of times, I think tonight mm -hmm. is this is very intentional. It's about having yeah. the setting an intention that I am no longer going to accept um, not prioritizing my own well-being. I, yes. I just will not accept that. No, no matter what that means, um, this is the year I am going to set an intention to take good care of myself. And I'm not going to feel guilty about it. And I'm not going to be gaslighted into believing that I, I, uh, that's somehow hurting my kids. Um, I have to, I want to take care of myself. And setting those boundaries is a huge part of that. It's not about adding a bunch of stuff necessarily to your to-do list. It's A lot of it's about boundary setting. But again, this book is a really good place for you to start, the Whole Teacher Weekly Wellness Guide, because, um, because it, it, it categorizes a bunch of different areas and you can start wherever you feel like you need to to get your own uh, well-being uh, mm -hmm. prioritized. So thank you, Lauren, so much for all of that. It was thank wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, this was awesome. All right, appreciate it. Take care. All right, everybody, that was Lauren Gergash. Again, you can go to livablelearning.net if you want to learn more about her work. I want to thank everybody for who tuned in tonight. I want to remind you that if you are interested in voicing your concern, about the voucher scheme to um, send uh, public school funds to private schools that are unaccountable and can discriminate. We all, I think anybody who's fair-minded can see that's a horrible, horrible idea. Uh, please voice uh, your concern to that about that. You can go to the SCEA.org slash S39. We've made it super easy for you to fill out a form, contact your senator, or reach out to your senators and state representatives and let them know that you do not that you want to protect public schools, that you believe in public schools, and that you don't want to see uh, our, our public tax dollars go to private schools that can discriminate against kids. We also would encourage you um, to, and I put this link uh, in the, so if you go into the comments, if you're watching, you can go into the comments, you can click this. Um, uh, and this is another, another thing that the SCEA has been fighting for, and that is to ensure that um, that teachers have the freedom to teach young people the truth about American history. I never thought that would be controversial, that we would want to teach kids the truth about what's happened throughout American history. All of the good stuff that's happened in America, but also some of the stuff that some of the mis huge mistakes and some of the tragedies and the horrors that have been committed uh, throughout our nation's history. It's important that we have a whole look at our history. The, the good, the bad, the ugly, everything and everything in between so that we can learn from that. We can learn from our successes. You know, we've had a lot of great, you know, put a man on the moon. Great. But we've also, we've also had some horrible things that have been done and we have to learn from those mistakes so we don't repeat them. And if we don't teach that in history, then we're not learning from those mistakes. So please, please, um, please support our, our efforts to ensure that young people and educators have access to the truth in our public schools. It's crazy to me that that's even a, 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 an issue. I want to um, preview um, Thursday's session coming up. Really excited about this. I want to thank Adrian King, who is the president of our local association down in Charleston. The Charleston County Education Association is going to have seven members come on Thursday night, 7 to 8 o'clock, right here. Um, you can go to the cool Facebook page, my personal Facebook page, or the SCEA's Facebook page, and tune into this. We're going to have a panel discussion about some of the issues that uh, educators in the low country and across South Carolina are facing. This is a really great panel. I'm really excited uh, about uh, giving these folks an opportunity to speak out on the, the issues that 
are important to them. So we hope to see everybody Thursday night, 7 o'clock. If you have any ideas or would like to share um, share your thoughts, you can go to the COOL website. Uh, there's, a, there's a contact form on the COOL website. You can also request free professional learning from us at the Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. We will come to public schools in South Carolina for free and offer a whole, we have a wide variety of sessions that we can offer your school. And all you have to do is go to the cool.us website and fill out the forum and I'll get in touch with you within, within a one or two business days and we'll get something worked out. I want to thank again, my our guest tonight, Lauren Gergash. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll see you Thursday night for our next live stream. You guys have a wonderful uh, week. <music>